to uh, quickly introduce who we are, since some of you have not been to these seminars before, and, and what the idea for this year is. And then Beth McManus is going to give um, the topic today, which is longitudinal data and analytic approaches. So I'm going to uh, intro for just a few minutes, and then she's going to describe examples of United States longitudinal data sets that are commonly used in children's outcomes research and give you some, um, an overview about analytic considerations for longitudinal samples, an overview and some unique considerations for uh, survey design and weights. And there's a lot of equations today, but don't get scared. Okay, so who are we? Basically, the Children's Outcomes Research Center um, and the, we, I direct the community, uh, the core program, and we focus on research to guide healthcare practice and policy for children. We are supported by the Children's Hospital. I also direct the community health and disease prevention part of Children's Hospital Research Strategic Plan. So those things come together in our program, and we designed uh, the seminar series last year to be an introductory kind of series, and this is um, step two of that, of that endeavor. So CORE, just to give you a little background, is one of a few research programs nationally that focuses exclusively on um, health care outcomes for children. We bring together a lot of resources, methodologies, and people from a lot of different disciplines. We focus on problems that are responsible for the greatest morbidity and mortality in children in the U.S. And we examine effectiveness at the individual, community, and national level. Uh, we have a couple of roles, and one is an institutional support role. So we do provide some consultation for faculty who are interested in doing translational or outcomes research. We, we provide a limited amount of mentorship. Um, and, for example, we have seminar series like the one we're doing today. So we, we, if, if any of you would like to have a consultation with our group at any time, you're welcome to do that. And as well, if you want to talk about your career and how to get training for this type of research, we'd be glad to meet with you about that. Um, we also have a role in local and national research development. We try to conduct state-of-the-art research that will uh, give us a national uh, presence, and we've had enormous growth in the last five years. We've, we've basically doubled our funding almost every year. Uh, these are the type of consultations and trainings we've done for various departments and sections, just to, sh just to show you the variety. Uh, we have some technical cores that, uh, that we share with the Colorado Health Outcomes Program. We have a biostats core, a qualitative core, a health information technology core, a core that focuses on practice-based research network as laboratories for studying interventions in the community, and we have a comparative effectiveness core. These are the current areas of research development that we're focusing on. We're very uh, nationally known for vaccine preventable disease uh, work and for uh, comparative effectiveness work. And we also have a Center for Excellence in Implementation Science and Preventive Medicine. We're fo we have a little bit uh, less developed, but developing areas of prevention of obesity, preventive uh, oral health, and children with spe special health care needs. So this is the second seminar. We, uh, this builds upon our first seminar that we did last year. We had six introductory sessions, and we got a lot of good feedback about that. We're likely going to repeat that um, maybe in the spring. But we also got some feedback that we, they, uh, some people would like a little bit higher level seminars, and we got some specific suggestions from people that we are trying to respond to. So again, as, as these sessions go on, please give us your feedback about other things you'd like to hear about, and we can respond to, to your desires. So we're going to have, uh, today we're going to talk about cohort studies and longitudinal analyses. On November 12th, there is a presentation about qualitative methods that Karen Albright, who leads our qualitative core, is going to give. That's actually going to be held at the UPI building, where core and coho are housed, and that's because it, it, it is bringing together a much larger audience. I would really recommend that to you if you're interested at all in qualitative work, because it's going to be a very good introductory, introductory and more and higher level uh, presentation. On November 19th, um, we're going to have a discussion of selection bias in outcomes research. 
On the 26th, I'm going to talk about comparative effectiveness and pragmatic trials. And then finally, on December 3rd, Dr. Lori Crane, who teaches the survey uh, methods class at the School of Public Health, is going to give a, an introduction to survey methods. So again, that will be really valuable. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Beth now. Okay, can you hear me okay? All right. And hopefully, so this is being videotaped, so hopefully I can walk around a little bit still and still be videoed. But I think they'll let me know if that's not the case. Okay, so as Ali mentioned, uh, the topic for today is uh, cohort studies and longitudinal analyses. And I just wanted to uh, start by defining a cohort study. So a cohort study is going to examine specific populations or subpopulations, um, for example, by age, hospital discharge, insurance coverage, diagnosis, and it's going to classify this, this group of people and then follow them over time. So an example might be um, a prospective cohort where uh, asthmatic children are identified and followed to measure their emergency department utilization. Cohort studies can also be retrospective. So an example might be a chart review of all pediatric asthma-related emergency department visits to determine what are predictors, what are family predictors, um, morbidity predictors, and so forth. So the cohort studies have a number of strengths. Um, they, uh, they limit the threats to internal validity. So for example, if you're following people over time, you, have, you can establish some, some temporality. Right, because you know the exposure happened before the outcome. So that's a huge strength for determining causal inference and, and promoting your internal, strengthening your internal validity. If it's a prospective study, if it's retrospective, it's a little bit more challenging because you, don't, you might not necessarily know the temporality of your exposure and your outcome. But this, and we stress this quite a bit in the first uh, seminar series, um, that's the importance of a good research question, right? To really map out what is your conceptual model of when you think the exposure happened, when you think the outcome happened, to be able to reduce some of that selection bias. And we're going to talk a lot more about that, as Ali mentioned, in, um, in a couple weeks. A big limitation of a cohort study is that it can take a long time for the outcome to occur. So if you're thinking about things that are relatively rare, you might have to wait for a long time um, for it to actually see the outcome and, and start to measure it. Um, okay, so let's talk about some common longitudinal data sets in children's outcomes research. So you, these are the ones that I'm going to cover today. The Early Childhood Longitudinal Study, which has both a birth cohort and two kindergarten cohorts. The National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, or Ad Health, as it's more commonly referred to. And National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, or the NLSY. And then the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. So you might look at these and say, well, I sort of have heard of a couple of them, but what, what do a lot of these have to do with health? Um, and you, you are correct in that. Um, many of them are not specifically focused on health. They're focused more on uh, income dynamics and education and that. But what I'm going to advocate is that a lot of these have very rich health measures. And so for some of the topics that you're interested in, these data might be, might be of interest, if, even if just to get it sort of a national, national represent. Of, of the outcomes that you're interested in. If you do want to learn more about health-specific surveys that aren't necessarily cohort surveys but have repeat measures, so the methods that I'm going to talk about today apply to these data sets, um, we talked about these in the first seminar series um, in the fourth module. So if you're interested in things like PRAMS, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, or KID, these are very commonly used in children's outcomes research. FIS, um, Medicaid data, and other sort of linked databases. If you go back, all of our, uh, the previous seminars were, have been archived. And so if you look at module, I believe it's four, on study design, or secondary data analysis, you can get a lot more information about, about the, all the data sets listed here, their strengths and limitations and so forth. All right, so let's start with ECHLs, as I, it's commonly referred. So the purpose of ECHLs, and this, these, um, the purposes are all taken directly from 
the uh, websites of the, of the um, umbrella agencies. So for this, it's the National Center for Education Statistics. So the purpose of ECHLS is to have three longitudinal studies to describe child development, school readiness, and early school experiences. So right, it, you're already probably thinking again, this has a huge education component. It's from National Center for Education Statistics. Um, it, so the birth cohort was a random sample of about 11,000 babies who were born in 2001. And the kindergarten cohorts, uh, there's two of them. The first one was ki children entering kindergarten in the academic year of 1998 and 99. And the second uh, was 2010, 2011. And for the kindergarten cohort, they were followed up every two to three years until they were in eighth grade. And for the birth cohort, they were followed up. So there's birth certificate information, so everything you can glean from a birth certificate. Their kids were followed up at 9, 24, 48, and 60 months. And so it has very, very rich information about uh, parent-reported school and home observations of children's physical, emotional health, child development. It includes teacher reports for kids in preschool, uh, rich developmental testing. So it provides you with um, a, a tremendous amount of data on not just educational experiences, but physicals and uh, social-emotional health, which might be of interest to, to this audience. And this is how you access the data here. And it's a, it's a, it is a somewhat lengthy process to apply for this data. Um, and I'm, I have used this quite a bit, so if you are interested in, in this, I'm happy to talk more um, about this after. Ad Health. The purpose of Ad Health is to, to study how social environments and behaviors in adolescents are linked to health and achievement outcomes in young adulthood. And so essentially the sampling scheme here was it includes about 20, a little over 21,000 adolescents in grades 7 through 12 uh, from 80 schools throughout the country. And the kids were followed up, the adolescents were uh, initially measured in 1994, followed up two years later in 96, then 2001 and 2, and most recently 2007 and 8. And again, very rich information from multiple sources so that the adolescents themselves were interviewed, the te their teachers were interviewed, there was a home visit done where parents were interviewed. And so it provides uh, very rich information about social networks, cognitive function, and the most recent data, uh, wave of data, also included biological samples. So thinking about stress and other biological samples in adolescents. Also, what it's very well known for um, is this network function. So social networking, um, social network analysis is becoming a very hot topic in outcomes research. And so even if you're not interested per se in adolescence, if you're interested in understanding about network analysis, and so for example, it's becoming a lot more popular in even the work that I do, thinking about you know, children with special health care needs and who they're, who's in their provider network, their family network, their provider network, and are they receiving a referral, for example, for equipment or behavioral health referral, and what happens after that? Do they actually receive services? And then thinking about what are some of the outcomes. So if you're interested in network analysis or you think it might be applicable to the work that you're doing, I highly recommend looking at some of the methods papers that use um, Ad Health, and I'm happy to send references if people are interested. Uh, and this is how you access the data. So NLS Y, um, you might be thinking, oh my goodness, you know, what is this? this is such an old data set. What does this have to do with children's outcomes research? And um, you would be correct about that for the overall sample. Um, however, the NLS Y79 was a subsample of women who were between the ages of 14 and 21 in 1979. And so they were followed up and their kids were recruited for this study. So, they're, it's, so you have very rich information about moms and babies and children. Um, so there's about 7,500 dyads, mom-child mom dyads. And the kids were followed up um, every two years starting in 1986 and includes information on um, you know, thinking about outcomes research, so things like program participation, so early intervention, WIC, other social programming that these children are, are um, participating in, their school experiences, parent-child interaction, expectations for the future, you know, once they get to be adolescents, thinking about dating and fertility and that. So if you're at all interested, sort of maternal risk factors or maternal factors associated with uh, child outcomes, this would be a really nice data set to access, and this is, this is the link for accessing it. The panel study of income dynamics, again, this is probably when you're thinking, you know, this is not something that 
you might automatically think of to use, and, and it is largely used by health economists because it th looks at things like um, income dynamics and early human capital formation, so things like earning and achievement and education and so forth. However, there's a child development supplement that, what, that includes about 4,000 children, so you have information about the parents and in some cases the grandparents. Um, so if you're interested in sort of thinking about risk and resilience over the life course, this is a fantastic uh, data set to use because it will give you grandparent information, parent information, and then child outcomes. So that there's about 4,000 kids that were followed. Um, they, were, they were initially measured in 1997, followed up again in 2002, and then most recently in 2007. And again, very rich information from multiple sources. So the, the children were interviewed, their teachers were interviewed, the parents were interviewed, and you have very rich information, again, on the parents and some, in some cases the grandparents because they were part of this initial, uh, the initial waves of data. So it has uh, a tremendous amount of information on physical and emotional health. This is probably most well known for the time use data. So for example, if you're interested in children with special health care needs, how much, or kids who are obese, how, how many hours a week or a day they're spending watching television, playing video games, uh, extracurricular activities, um, this will give you uh, very rich information about that because the kids and the families filled out diaries. And again, probably as expected, things like savings and their expectations for graduation. And um, It does have some program participation information around special education, early intervention, and early uh, care and education experiences. And this is the website to use it, and it's incredibly user-friendly. Um, you essentially look at the list of variables and just click off the ones that you want. They'll pull together a data set for you. They'll make a code book. It's very, very easy to use and has a tremendous amount of rich information. So that's just a very quick, brief overview of some, um, some data sets. And like I said, if you are interested in the other ones, the more administrative data, we, there's a detailed seminar on those. But some additional considerations when you're thinking about these cohort studies and thinking about longitudinal analyses, these data have a, uh, have a, have a lot of strengths, um, particularly compared to most surveys that are cross-sectional or a snapshot in time. So a major strength is that you can capture the dynamic nature of a number of risk and resilience factors, so medical, social, and developmental and health experiences over the life course. Um, it also, many of them include contextual variables, so if you're interested in not only the family environment or the school environment, this provides very rich information about both of those. And many of them, if not all of them actually, you can request uh, zip code data. So if you're interested in sort of zip code or community, community factors uh, and their influence on child development, physical, emotional health and so forth, this, these, that is very easy to do with these data sets. Limitations, similar to sec other secondary data sources, right? So it, you didn't collect this data or these data weren't collected to answer your specific research question. So it may be that when the data were collected, the follow-up times don't, aren't exactly what you would want. Maybe you'd want a smaller follow-up time or a longer one. Um, the specific variables might not coincide with your exact research question. And especially when you're asking a you know, tremendous amount of questions of families, you know, the, the level that, of depth that any one particular question can ask is, is going to be limited, right? So if you're interested in parent-infant interaction, for example, or parent-child interaction, there's maybe only five to seven questions about that, which is a start, but you know, if that's your focus, you may, you might, may be limited in, in your analyses. And other things to consider that I don't necessarily have all the answers for. I think the, the field is still growing with regard to these things. Um, and that is how we define and operationalize cumulative risk and resilience. So thinking about not only a risk perspective, but resilience and how that changes over time, right? And how we measure that and so forth. And that's going to have implications for how we analyze these data. And then this idea of risk also being related to cumulative exposure to uh, health services. So this is a topic that I'm particularly interested in and in thinking about children with developmental delays and how you know, does the persistence of a developmental delay affect how often, what types of services you get, how, you know, how often, and so forth. Um, and like I said, I think as a field, as the life course, as life course methodology is growing and becoming more prevalent, these are things that I think we're going to have to start to think more critically about. 
Okay, questions before I get into the, the scary equations? No? Okay. So, I, well, I will just say that most of those data sets that I mentioned, I've, I have, I've used, with the exception of the ad health one. Um, so if you have, if anything that I mentioned piqued your interest, please feel free to contact me, um, and I can kind of talk with you more about that, or talk with you more about how you might analyze these data. So the big question to start with is why do we even, why am I even giving this talk? Why did we include it? Why do you need special analytic approaches for longitudinal data? All right, so here we are, the ugly equations. And so a colleague, a fellow methodologist once told me that when you're giving a methods talk, if you don't include any Greek, then people think you don't know what you're talking about. But if you include too much, then people get, start to wiggle in their seat. So I'm hoping that I'm gonna strike a balance and, and include just enough that hopefully will build off what you know um, but also, you know, for many of you, you won't actually be doing the, the analyses, but it's helpful to know sort of what's going on under the hood um, and to have a, you know, kind of a general sense. And that's, that's my goal for today, that you'll have a general sense of what the, these types of analyses look like, whether you do them yourself or you have a, a consultant do them, um, and then, you know, why it's important to, to build off the models that you're probably most familiar with. And, and I will ground this in an example, so it will be um, very more theoretical than methodological. But so just to start with a model that probably many of you, if not all of you, are very familiar with, and that's a generalized linear model. So thinking about our linear regression, our logistic regression, our ANOVAs, our, our sort of basic generalized linear, generalized linear model. So it has several components. So the mean of the dependent variable, so if I'm interested in um, pulmonary function, let's just say I'm interested, or blood pressure. I'm interested in blood pressure among former preemies, okay? So what I'm essentially gonna be looking at is, this is my equation here, right? So I'm gonna be looking at blood pressure as my outcome, average, average blood pressure based on a number of covariates. So let's just say preterm birth, whether you're born early or not preemie, and then looking at blood pressure at three years of age, let's say. So what I'm going to be modeling is mean blood pressure, so average blood pressure in my cohort. I'm also going to be looking at the distribution of blood pressure and hope that it's, it's a normal distribution. So it has a mean and it has a normal bell curve, what we're used to seeing. I'm also going to be thinking about the relationship between my mean outcome, my mean blood pressure, and whether or not the child was born preterm. Right? And so for those of you who are, who are familiar with the link function, that's essentially what the link function does. It allows the right and left side of the equation to communicate. And then I'm also going to be thinking about the variability of my observations. So I'm going to have multiple uh, blood pressures on a whole, you know, a whole cohort of kids. Some are going to be born preterm and some are not. And I'm, what I'm going to assume is that there's going to be noise in that data, right? There's noise in every data. So every time I take a blood pressure, there's going to be some error around that, and that's called noise. But what I'm going to assume is that that noise is consistent across my whole sample, right? And it's just noise in my equation. I'll include it, and I'm not really going to think more about it, actually, after that. So that's why I don't even have any Greek up there for that, because it's just sort of included in the equation. So this is what it looks like to break it down. So this is the mean of my dependent variable, and I'm assuming it has some kind of normal distribution or some kind of distribution that I can, that I can describe. And that there's a relationship between the right and left side of the equation, all right? And so that type of equation has a number of assumptions. And the biggest one is that the, the data, my observations, are independent and identically distributed, or IID. So what does that mean? It means that when I think about this mean, where this mean comes from, it's from a, oops, sorry, it's from a random sample, right? So I have a thousand kids, some of them are born preterm, some are not, and I'm assuming that it's just a random sample of babies, okay, or three-year-olds, um, of my population of interest. I'm also assuming that the individual observations, that that bell curve, that blood pressure is, forms a normal distribution, has a mean and then, you know, um, predictable variability around that, or normal, a normal distribution. I'm also assuming, and this is probably the biggest one, that the observations from different individuals are independent. So that, for example, if I have a blood pressure on Andrew and I have Hannah's blood pressure, that they're knowing something about Andrew tells me nothing about Hannah, right? They're totally independent. They're picked from two separate clinics, one in Massachusetts and one in Colorado, and they have nothing to do with each other. 
And I'm also assuming that any kind of noise around Andrew and Hannah's ver uh, blood pressure measurements have nothing to do with each other. There's no reason why any of that noise would be related thinking about whether or not they were born preterm. So if you think about the error being on the y-axis and preterm birth being on the x-axis, that, that noise around the data is just a big cloud, right? There's no predictable pattern to it. It's not linear, it's just a cloud of error measurements. Okay, so that's what I'm assuming with a regular, um, regular linear regression, logistic regression, and so forth. However, when our, with our longitudinal data, a lot of those assumptions are violated, okay? And I'll just describe a couple of them. And the biggest one is that the observations from different individuals are not independent, okay? And there's a couple reasons why that might occur, or they're correlated. So, they're, so that essentially means that when I take Andrew's blood pressure and I have Hannah's blood pressure, knowing, knowing Andrew's blood pressure tells me something about Hannah's blood pressure. And the reason that occurs is if Hannah and Andrew are seen in the same clinic, kids who are seen in the same clinic or who are in the same classroom, who are in the same family, anything that links them together means that their observations are going to be correlated with each other. So that violates the assumptions of my regular model. So I need to take that into account when I do my, my analyses. Now, it could be that they're random individuals, but that I have, I have survey methods that pooled people from schools or states or something like that. So two people living in Massachusetts, two three-year-olds living in Massachusetts are much more alike than a three-year-old living in Massachusetts and a three-year-old living in Colorado for a number of reasons, right? Because they're in the same you know, socio-political context and so forth. So again, those observations are correlated. So when we have national data sets that use that the, any of the data sets that I mentioned, because of their sampling scheme, we need to include these design effects that make kids more alike than different. Does that make sense? Okay. And we also know that the variability of observations, remember I said the noise around Andrew's blood pressure and the noise around Hannah's can't, can't be related. And normally they wouldn't be if you have a random sample. But in, this, in the case of repeat measures, if you know, if, if you have five blood pressures on Andrew, right, if you know the first one, it tells you something about, you can predict something about the second one, right? So any repeat measures are inherently going to be correlated because you know information about people. So there's multiple sources of correlation here that isn't, isn't um, you know, it doesn't mean you can't do the analyses, it just means that you need to take into account that, cor that correlation, okay? And there's a couple ways that we can do it. Um, we can take a population-specific approach, which gives you population estimates, population estimates of the relationship, for example, between being born preterm and what your blood pressure is at three years. Or we can do subject-specific approaches. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these. And subject-specific approaches, that there are two big, um, two big families of modeling. The first is hierarchical linear modeling or multi-level modeling, which you might have heard of. And the second is latent variable modeling. I'm not going to talk at all about latent variable modeling, um, but I'm going to focus on the, the multi-level models. Okay, so I want to ground this in, in an example to make it hopefully um, clearer and have it make more sense. So the study question is, does utilization of early intervention therapy, so physical, occupational, or speech therapy, therapy improve cognitive function over time for children born preterm or low birth weight? So the data I'm going to present is a somewhat fictitious example, fictitious nationally representative sample of preterm and low birth weight infants born in 2001 in the United States. So this is, you know, a fictitious data example, but it's actually based on real analyses, and what I'll present to you is actually real, real numbers. So we're going to use longitudinal analyses to account for the complex survey design. And I put an asterisk here because for those of you familiar with this topic or familiar with these types of methods, you might be saying, well, wait a second, how is it that you're looking at um, the effect of early intervention in this group? We know that kids who do and don't receive early intervention look very, very different from each other. How can you have a balanced group? So the other thing that methodologists like to do, in addition to presenting a lot of Greek, is to sort of hand wave over some of these things. So for today, I'm going to hand wave over how I got the groups to be balanced. But if you're really interested, um, I'll be talking about, I use propensity score matching, and I'm going to be talking about that in two weeks, I think it is. Um, so for now, you'll just have to trust me that the groups are, are balanced in terms of um, predictors for early intervention. Okay. So let's, the first thing to do, right, is just to look at, look at our data, 
Okay, so just to orient you to this figure, this is a measure of cognitive function, and this is time. So it was measured in this data set at 16 months, 24 months, and 36 months. Okay, and this is what it looked like. So it dipped down at 24 months and then went um, increased again at 36 months. And this is the average, right? So back to that equation where you're looking at average, you know, your, your average uh, value for your dependent variable, this is, this is what it looks like. And it's important to look at this data because often you can, if I had more time points here, this probably would look less linear, right? And that's important to know because if it's not linear, and for example, it slowly declines and then increases rapidly, which these data actually do, you're gonna need to, to think about that in, in terms of how you model your outcome, right? Because it's not a linear, it's not a linear relationship anymore, right? It's more of a quadratic. Um, so something, you know, the first step is always just to look at, look at your outcome mean, means over time. Okay, so we're gonna just extend that model that I presented earlier, right? So the, the GLM that, that we talked about earlier can be extended to accommodate all this, these sources of correlation, right? So this is exact, just what we saw before. So we have the mean outcome, we have the relationship between the predictors and the mean outcome. We have some kind of distribution, but now we need to specify how the, these data are correlated, right? And so that essentially means that we have to come up with some correlation matrix where the relate, the, how our data over time are correlated. So time one, time two, time three, time four, time one, time two, and how those, the, for each observation, how those are, are correlated. And we can do that very easily using a, a um, analytic approach called Generalized Estimating Equations, or GEE. And essentially what a GEE model is gonna do is just include what we know already, and then it's gonna allow you to specify some kind of correlation matrix to show how these data are, are related to each other. And for those of you who use SAS, and if this is helpful, this is what it looks like in SAS. And this is gonna give us a population average. So on average, for three-year-olds who were born, who were born preterm, on average, what is, their, what is their blood pressure? Okay, it's the overall effect, or for this example here, it's gonna be the overall effective therapy for a matched sample of infants born preterm or low birth weight. Okay, so it's PROC, Gen Mod, and SAS, for those of you who use that. And so I just have a class variable about whether or not they received therapy, yes or no. And then I'm gonna model therapy and then a number of variables for time. And if you remember here, this just means I'm including time. And because of that quadratic looking um, pattern, I'm including time as a quadratic equation, okay? And so here, I can specify my distribution, like we talked about before, whether it's normal or some kind of other type of distribution. I can specify a length function, so the relationship between the right and left side of the equation. And it allows me to show where the correlation is coming from. So, so the fact that kids' individual observations over time are gonna be more correlated, I'm specifying that here with my repeated subject um, statement. And I'm also able to think about the correlation that I get within subjects. And so this is what the overall SAS code looks like, if that's helpful. This, mo these this type of model has a tremendous amount of flexibility, meaning that kids don't have to be measured at the same time interval, because we know, especially for, you know, if you're collecting clinic data, kids don't, you know, even if you want them to come back in six months, sometimes it's five months, sometimes it's eight months, and so forth. So if you have varying intervals, this model can, can accommodate those varying intervals. Um, it also allows you to have a lot of flexibility in, in what your correlation looks like. So you, it could be that there it's, um, it's very predictable in terms of you have very little correlation between variables or you can have it be no specification. So you allow the model to kind of figure out what, what the correlation is. So it gives you a lot, tremendous amount of flexibility there. It looks like. And so just to orient you again here, this is cognitive function. This is 16 months, 24 months, and 36 months. And the blue is the group who, did not, who received therapy, and the yellow is the one who didn't receive therapy. So you might look at this like I did and say, you know, one, one um, conclusion is early intervention doesn't work, right? Because these are almost, you know, these are exactly on top of each other. There's no difference between the two groups. However, you could also say, hmm, I wonder if this is the best approach to do this. This is telling me, on average, 
there's no effective therapy for um, you know, population average on you know, population average cognitive function. So for those of you who know this population and know the data, this is more of what the data looks like. Okay? So let's just say we're taking this 36 month outcome. Right? So let's just take, make, take a snapshot of this. Okay? So this is nationally what the data actually look like. So to orient you to this, again, this is cognitive score here. And instead of time here, this is gestational age. So on average, we know that there's a positive association between gestational age and cognitive function, right? So the later you're born, you know, 37 weekers on average are going to have higher cognitive function than 24 weekers. But look at what else there is. There's a for each week, there's a tremendous amount of variability, okay? Where some 24 weekers show have average cognitive function, and some 34 weekers have have well below average cognitive function. So that's not only just methodologically interesting, it's also clinically interesting, right? Because we know that probably this difference in here, we want to explain that difference, right? Is it access to health services? Is it the family environment? Is it morbidity? What, what explains some of this? We don't want to, and essentially what happens when you do a population average, you ignore this. Right? You don't, you don't model this at all. You just sort of come up with a way to categorize it. It's included in the model and you get a population average. Right? But if this part is of interest to you, which often it is, then you need a different type of method right? to, to capture, capture this, this um, rich variability. And so this is what our data actually looks like. And you can see again, tons of variability at each time point. So at 16 months, you know, some kids are, are what, you know, two standard deviations below the mean, and some kids are you know, a standard deviation, or you know, three quarters of a standard deviation above the mean. And you see that variability throughout, right? So let's now think about a way that we can capture this. All right, so more ugly equations. And so what we're going to do with subject-specific approaches is we're going to exploit that heterogeneity or exploit that variability with, um, for each observation because it's usually of clinical interest to us. So we're going to extend that generalized the GLM. And instead of having a one-level model like we did before, we're going to split it up into a two-level model. And so essentially the two levels represent both within individual or within child variability and between child and variability. So kids are going to vary. So if we go back here, kids are going to vary. Each individual child is going to have variability over time. Okay? And then at each given time point, there's going to be between child variability. Okay? So that, those two sources of variability or variance we're going to capture. And if you, this is helpful to you, Great. If it's not, then you can just ignore it. You don't need to know this part. But if you are interested, you break it down into a within child variability, including time. And then the second level is the between child variability. And you can include a number of predictors, right? So it might be length of NICU hospitalization. It might be a number of family social factors and so forth. You can include those in the level two model and then combine it for an overall multi-level model that's going to look at trajectories over time and mo explicitly model within and between child variability. All right, so again, if it's helpful, this is what the, the actual data, look, the code looks like. And I use MLWIN. There's a number of statistical programs out there, HLM, AMOS. There's a, a number that can do multi-level models. Um, and basically what this is doing is looking at IQ over um, time. Right? and whether or not the kids received therapy or not. So essentially, a lot of these variables are the same as what we saw in the PROC Gen mod, right? With therapy, time, therapy, um, time squared to account for that acceleration between 24 and 36 months. And then I'm just explicitly modeling the variability. So this is my you know, um, variance covariance matrix, if that's helpful to you. So then what happens when we actually do this? When we plot it out, Again, to orient you on the y-axis is cognitive score and the x-axis is time. And now we see that the red solid line is, is the kids who received therapy and the dotted line is the kids who did not. So it appears, and these are, this is statistically significantly different, um, it appears that there are positive effects of participating in early intervention therapy on cognitive outcome trajectories. Okay? And so why are these models different? right? And when do you use which one? 
So some other considerations. Just check the time here. Right, okay. Um, so the first one, the GEE, is called a marginal model, and that gives you the population estimates. And the multi-level model was the second one that gives you subject specific. And so how do you decide which one to use? Because I ran the data both ways. And it really is going, it goes back to the importance of your research question and your theoretical model. So if you think that there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity and that's of clinical interest to you, programmatic interest and so forth, then you're probably going to want to go with a multi-level model. If you just want population effects and you, don't, you just want to, the, the individual heterogeneity is more of a nuisance, and it, it, it's actually called a nuisance parameter, then you can just account for that. Correlation, you can account for that heterogeneity, and you can just get population estimates. And population estimates are very easy to interpret, right? The multi-level ones are a little bit more challenging to interpret, especially if you're doing, if your outcome is dichotomous. They're a little bit easier if it's linear, um, but it, when your outcome is dichotomous, it, they, they, they do get challenging to interpret. Um, so then the other issue is, and I, don't, I won't get into a lot of detail now, but how you account for the weights, right? So if you're doing a subject-specific model and you have kids, you have repeat measures of kids nested within a state, you have a tremendous amount of correlation there that you need to account for. The data set, the, the um, folks who house the data will give you weights, but then the question is, if you have you know, fewer children in Massachusetts compared to Colorado, do you scale the weights? Do you account for these types of differences? And that's a, a debate right now that you know, I don't want to belabor, but just something that you know, if you're running data like this that you want to talk to your methodologist about. Um, missing data, what you do, you know, because we know, especially with longitudinal samples, that if, if the data you're collecting yourself, you're going to have missing information on covariates, kids aren't going to show up for follow-up appointments and so forth, and how you deal with the missing data and what kind of biases it might be introduced by ignoring the missing data or do, using methods to impute the data. And then thinking about causal inference, right? So many of the variables that I talked about, um, at least related to socioeconomic factors for families, by and large aren't going to change over time. But that's not completely true, that some of the, and how you deal with time varying covariates, because you're going to get rich information about, you know, so some kids might be living in a low-income family and then not, and back and forth. They may attend a specific program for a period of time and then not, so that the exposures that they're getting aren't, aren't always consistent. And so how, you, how are you going to capture that, that variability in, in exposure over time? because it has big implications for causal inference. And again, not something that you necessarily need to know the methods on how to, you know, how to take, take into account time varying covariates, but something to think about when you're, you, you know, you're writing your theoretical model, you're meeting with an analyst or a methodologist about, about your research project. Okay, so conclusions. There are a number of existing nationally representative data sets um, that are commonly used in children's outcomes research, even if it's not they, they don't seem immediately obvious, you know, education and income type data. But all of them have rich information on a number of determinants of health, neurodevelopment, and well-being from infancy all the way to adolescence. So again, thinking about this life course perspective. Analytic approaches to appropriately analyze these data are becoming increasingly used by health services researchers or child, children's outcomes researchers. And the choice of your modeling, whether you go with a population-specific approach or subject-specific, is really going to depend on your research question. And I can't emphasize the importance of developing a very strong research question before you get started and a very, very strong theoretical framework. So literally mapping out you know, your exposures and your outcomes and where variables fit in is, is critical. And the field is still growing with regard to the appropriate analyses <laughs> of complex data and, and its interpretation. So I think we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Can anyone, uh, does anyone have research that relates to this? I mean, are there any examples that, or questions you have? That well, I mean, that? not on this. I mean, how do you use that? It's smaller, though. We do it the same thing all the time. Do you mind using that? Yeah, in, uh, in orthopedics, especially with individuals having two limbs, so that you have that, that level of clustering. So this is obviously an issue that's applicable on a number of different levels. Mm -hmm. 
So are you, are you doing some outcomes research now, thinking? Yeah. Yeah, so what, what, what's one example of your research question? Uh, I mean, okay, so right now one of the things we're looking at is uh, with uh, club feet, outcomes of club feet. And yeah. one of the things you have to consider is that um, we have multiple feet from each subject, so figuring out a way to account for that in the, in the model since yeah. we're debating between the two different approaches is yeah. important. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's a great example of, of clustering because you know the response to whatever intervention that you're going to do is going to be more, you know, if you're doing r comparing right and left, it's going to be more alike than a random right and left person, you know, foot on to other um, babies that aren't, that aren't related, sure. And then if you're, the other thing is if you're doing a multiple, you know, to extend it further, if you, I don't know if you're doing it in just one clinic or, you know, if, if it eventually becomes a multi-center or multi-clinic, then you have other levels of clustering, right? So, be, so that not only the within child with the feet, but then also two kids in one clinic are going to be more alike than, you know, kids in separate clinics. So you have another layer of, of clustering. And that's, that's all an empirical question, too. I mean, it's very easy to figure out how much do you even need to worry about that? Because if you can measure that level of clustering, and if it's very small, you can ignore it most of the time. Um, and figuring out it may be that your clustering is more at the clinic level than the, the, child, the foot level, the child level. Um, but that's all empirical and very easy to, to measure. Got Scott? Yep. I know, sorry. <laughs> Um, it seems like a generalized estimating equation. So I'm wondering um, if you just plan on putting that in your code every single time, or do people how 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 messed up do the uh, results have uh, show up if they can forget that? If you forget to do yeah. it, so I mean I think whenever you know the first thing you should always do is look at look plot out your data, and if it really looks like and and so. So if it really looks like you know, it's declining and then it's a quick, a rapid acceleration, then you're probably going to need some kind of quadratic term. So if you, if you forget it, then what you're essentially going to be doing is modeling it as linear. So you're going you're to miss information. So it could be that your results, you're, you're underestimating you know, the true effect because you're not modeling it. You're not modeling it appropriately. You're modeling it as a linear relationship when in fact it's quadratic, and had you modeled it as quadratic, then you would get you know, a truer, truer estimate of the effect. Um, however, you know, like anything, it's going to come with some drawbacks. So when you have, when you have an, a quadratic term in there, that means so you're, so if you think about all the terms that were in that equation, I had therapy, time, and then the quadratic term. And then I'm having, I'm thinking about the correlation for all of those terms. So that's what we call a lot of degrees of freedom, right? Because I'm, I have to estimate all of those parameters. And so it, you could be limited in that sense. And you might have to tweak your model a little bit to be able to actually have it fit. Because it could just sort of not converge or blow up on you because you're trying to estimate too many things and you don't have a big enough sample size to do it. I'll get you that. Yeah, so it's clear from some of your questions and comments that some of you uh, really understand what we were talking about, and some of you may not. And if you don't, the, the, the lesson is these are some of the strengths and limitations of longitudinal data, and it's complicated. So get a grown up biostats person to help you with the analysis. <laughs> and you know, that's fine. And, and it's important to know sometimes, you know, I'm not gonna do that, but I understand it's a little quicksand. I know there are things to avoid. I'm gonna get appropriate help. Okay, so that's, you can take this lecture on two levels. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna remind you, the next one is gonna be at the UPI building, qualitative methods, really excellent. If you're, you know, qualitative methods, focus groups, um, structured interviews, very rich type of data collection that a lot of outcomes people really know how, really need to know how to do. So we hope you can come. Thanks. And I also want to emphasize, so the, the consultation. So please come, please email me. My email's right up here. Please email me. If you have questions, you want to meet with me, 
you know, even if you're at early, early stages, if you're just coming up with your research question, it has nothing to do with longitudinal data, please, you know, that's my job um, to meet with folks. So please, please feel free to, to email. And I'm also available to meet with people, although I don't usually, I'm not as good at the analysis as you, but I would be glad to meet with any of you who are thinking about a career in this area or who want a basic discussion about, you know, how to do this kind of research. Reach either one of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Thanks.